I would like you to ask, or rather, I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, and begin, if you will, in chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. And I'm going to begin with the very first verse. In those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor, and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. They were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Now jump forward to chapter 7. And let's pick up there at verse 54. <clears throat> when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And that is, he died. The word witness uh, comes to us from the same root as the word martyr. And both ideas were surely embodied in the account of Stephen. As far as we know, he was the very first Christian to be murdered for his faith in Jesus Christ. and But he's largely remembered because of who was standing nearby watching him be stoned to death. Look at chapter 7, verse 58. It says, And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Saul of Tarsus would be known to us as the Apostle Paul the greatest single Christian in church history, a man who traveled around the Mediterranean world at that time, preaching Jesus Christ, winning souls to faith in Jesus Christ, planting churches, teaching doctrine, grounding believers in what they ought to know and what they ought to believe, and ultimately writing over half of the New Testament. But his own conversion later in Acts chapter 9 began with a conviction after witnessing the death of Stephen here in Acts chapter 7. Most of the world, I suppose, would still acknowledge the ministry of D.L. Moody, Dwight L. Moody, in the late 1800s. One of the best evangelists the United States ever produced in its history. He preached around the country and uh, preached in Europe and England. He led thousands of people to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Founded the Moody Bible Institute, a, a, a school which, although they don't believe the King James Bible any longer, that school still exists. 
in Chicago. But how many people remember the name of a man named Edward Kimball? Edward Kimball was a Sunday school teacher when Moody was 18 years old. And he went to his shoe store where Moody was working, and he led young Moody to Jesus Christ. That means any fruit from Moody's ministry also redounded to the ministry of Edward Kimball. You know, the nation just buried Billy Graham. And it was said repeatedly during that funeral week that he had preached to over 200 million people during his lifetime. But there was not even a mention of the name of the man under whose ministry Billy Graham got saved. Billy Graham was 16. He went forward under the preaching of an independent Baptist named Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham, besides having an uh, unusual name, uh, was no slouch. He had traveled to 22 states as an evangelist in those days and uh, counted over 300,000 new converts to Jesus Christ during his ministry. But the world largely forgot about him. However, um, any soul saved under the preaching of Billy Graham also gets credited to the faithfulness of Mordecai Ham. The word of God is full of unsung heroes whose lives and their actions uh, might have been uh, missed by men, ignored by men, but they were certainly noticed by God. And with that idea in mind, I want to call this sermon the spirit of Stephen. The spirit of Stephen. But first, Every one of us is indebted to somebody who has studied the Bible before us and can help us to understand what we're reading. I certainly appreciate men who I think are more meticulous in their Bible study than I am many times because I learn from them, and especially when it comes to doctrinal application of verses. Uh, yeah, I'm one of these kind of guys. I just like reading the Bible. I like reading a few more chapters every day, work my way through it, and just enjoy what I'm reading. And I don't always pay attention to some little detail in there. But some guys have a great talent that the Lord undoubtedly gave them to see things there and say, that goes with that, that goes with that. And they put these pieces together, and they can help teach the Bible to the rest of us, dumbbells like me. And... Uh, just to give you an example, Stephen said he saw the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, verse 56. Why was Christ standing in Stephen's vision? Was he simply moved uh, by the excitement taking place at Stephen's persecution? Perhaps, but probably not. When Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, Christ was said to be seated. Acts 2.34, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand. He is said to be seated in heaven now. Hebrews 8, verse 1, He is a high priest, the Bible says, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Christ had told the high priest, Matthew 26.64, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He wouldn't rise from his throne until he was ready to return. Stephen also said in verse 56, Behold, I see the heavens open. The heavens were said to be opened in connection with Christ's first coming. Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17. The heavens are also said to be opened in connection with his second coming. At the rapture, Revelation 4, verse 1. 
after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. And at Christ's visible return later, Revelation 19, verse 11, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Peter had preached earlier in Acts chapter 3. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Acts 3 verses 18 through 20. Had the high priest and the angry mob repented at the testimony of Stephen, Christ was standing ready to return. Daniel's 70th week would have commenced. There was no reason why it should not. Consider there was already a body of believers made up of Jews and Gentiles. Acts chapter 2 verse 10 says there were Jews uh, who were proselytes. They were converts. To Judaism. So they were Jews, but they were also Gentiles by birth. Um, Christ spoke about John the Baptist and the prophecy that uh, Elijah would reappear before the Messiah showed up. And he said, If you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Matthew 11, verse 14. But of course, they didn't receive Christ by and large. And so John the Baptist uh, did not fulfill that role at Christ's first coming. And here, rather than repent at Stephen's testimony, instead, they rebel at the preaching of Jesus Christ. They couldn't kill Christ a second time, and so uh, they did the next best thing. They killed Stephen instead. And Jesus had told his disciples, beware when all men speak well of you. And he said, uh, um, they'll stone you and they'll... They'll throw you out of the synagogues, and they'll persecute you for my name's sake. By the Bible telling us that Saul was a young man, the implication is that Stephen must have been considerably older than Saul or Paul. Sometimes we think of Stephen as a young man too, but probably not. Perhaps he had followed Jesus during his ministry, and he had had some time to weigh all of the implications of Christ's miracles, his crucifixion, the prophecies concerning his ministry and his preaching, his resurrection, which could not be hid. And 1 Corinthians tells us over 500 witnesses saw him alive after his resurrection. And uh, he had evidently come to believe on Jesus, and he understood him to be the, 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 the Messiah that had been prophesied so long ago. But... Concerning the spirit of Stephen, he had several qualities every Christian should possess, or every Christian should want to possess. Point number one, he was filled with the Holy Spirit to serve. Notice chapter 6, verse 1, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. These were Greeks who had turned to Judaism and now turned to following Jesus Christ, whose women were being overlooked, burdened with waiting on tables and providing food for all of the disciples gathered together, uh, so much so that they were unable to hear the apostles' teaching. And uh, that much was is clear from verse 2. It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Stephen being among them. Stephen was a good man. Verse 3 says, He was a man of honest report. Now, Romans 3.12 says, There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That's in connection with righteousness before God. 
But when you're known as being honest, when you're known as being truthful and trustworthy, the world considers you to be a good man or a good woman. And I'm using the word good in, in that sense of the term. Some Christians at your school or at your job are just as dishonest as anybody else. You know which ones they are. You don't want to be like that kind of Christian. Stephen was not only a good man, but Stephen was a godly man. It says in verse 3 also, he was full of the Holy Ghost. People should see you as someone in whom God lives. I'm waiting for an amen on that, but uh, someone, people should see you as someone in whom God lives and, and uh, is operating. They should sense that you're a godly man or a godly woman by uh, your demeanor when you're around other people, by your smile, by your sense of humor, by your work habits, by your convictions about right and wrong, by your ability to defend the scriptures and explain the gospel in simple terms that any moron could get. The Holy Ghost of God wants you to be known as a Christian, as someone led by Jesus Christ, led by God the Father, as a believer. Stephen was a good man. He was a godly man. And let me say, Stephen was a gifted man. Verse 3 says he was filled with wisdom. And verse 8 says he was full of faith and power and did great wonders and miracles among the people. Not every believer can be described like that these days. Uh, the text doesn't tell us what the wonders and the miracles were that he carried out. But let me say, if you ever expect God to use your life and cause you to be fruitful in Christ's service, you're going to have to become full of faith and power in prayer and full of wisdom in the word of God. I appreciate what uh, Sister Frances was telling me earlier how much she wants to read the Bible and wants to read more of the Bible. There are certain things you, you can't do too much of. You know, they say you know, too much of any good thing is a bad thing. Well, there are certain things you can't get enough of. You can't pray too often. You can't read the Bible too much. You can't be around other Christians and enjoy fellowship too much. Well, sometimes they wear on your nerves, but generally speaking. And Christ said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. John 15, verses 7 and 8. But Stephen was a good man. He was a godly man, and he was a gifted man. Secondly, let me say this today. He was filled with the Holy Spirit to speak. Half of chapter 6 and all of chapter 7 are St is Stephen's testimony before this angry mob of uh, Jewish inquisitors, as it were. Chapter 6, verse 9 says there was a number of Jews from multiple cities disputing with Stephen. Verse 10 says, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Could that be said of you? That you can give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear? Are you someone who has studied to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth? You know, in this Laodicean church age, the more ignorant professing Christians are of the scriptures, the less effort it takes for you to be seen as some great scholar. That just occurred to me not too many years ago that the more ignorant of the Bible more and more Christians are, the less effort it takes for me to be seen as a real Bible student. By the way, the word scholar means a student. It doesn't mean an expert. Um, all you have to do is, if you can quote a verse in a timely manner and cite the book, the chapter, and the verse, they won't know what hit them. They really won't. I had a friend uh, who was talking to somebody about the King James Bible. Uh, compared to the modern translations. And Matthew 5, verse 22, Jesus said, 
whosoever is, ang- whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And uh, the modern translations leave, they omit those three words without a cause. And with those three words missing, Jesus becomes a sinner like everybody else because Jesus got angry a time or two, but he had a reason for doing so. But we take those three words without a cause out of the verse, then he's a sinner like anybody else. And my friend showed that one verse to somebody, and that's all it took for that guy to say, from now on, I'm only trusting the King James Bible. Thank God for that. Matthew 7, verse 14. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The New King James Version says, straight is the gate and difficult is the way which leadeth unto life. Let me say it's not difficult to get saved. It's a very simple thing to get saved, a very simple matter. Admit you're a sinner to God and and trust that Jesus Christ suffered on your behalf. He He was being judged and punished at Calvary for your sins on your behalf as a substitute for you. And on that basis, his virtue, his perfection and righteousness can be applied to you. and Your sins can be put upon him. And a great spiritual transaction takes place. And it can happen that fast. But Stephen spoke. He reminded the Jews of their great heritage they had as Jews. Look at chapter 7, verse 2. Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. God of glory appeared unto our father, Abraham, when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Verse 8, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac. And then he goes on and says, uh, Isaac begat Jacob and Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs. He reminded them of the great heritage they had being Jews. But he also reminded them of their ancestors' stubbornness. Look at chapter 7, verse 9. The patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. Verse 35, this Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? Verse 41, they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. And then he eventually got down to their own guilt. Not just the ancestors, not just your great, 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 great grandparents as Jews. What about you? He brought it right down and made it personal. Verse 51, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. He brought down their own sense of guilt, their own culpability and responsibility before God. I've heard countless ministers during in my day job who think that they can present the gospel of Jesus Christ without mentioning the word sin. He can't do it because he was an honest man. Uh, He didn't hold anything back. He told them they were sinners whether they wanted to hear it or not. And that's how you ought to be as a believer. Have the spirit of Stephen to speak and not hold anything back. Don't candy coat or sugar coat the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're a sinner. You need to be forgiven by God. And Jesus Christ suffered for your sake and bore the judgment of your sin in in your place. And a, and a very simple transaction can take place between you and God when you admit that and come to God with that understanding. But this idea of let Jesus come into your life and come to faith, and all that sort of psycho babble gobble, you, I have no idea what the guy's getting out, getting at. It's like Dr. Ruckman used to talk about preachers who would keep their audience in a holding pattern and never land anywhere. That's what a lot of preachers do. Lastly, let me say this. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit to suffer. He suffered voluntarily. Look back at chapter 7. Let's begin at verse 55 and read through verse 60 again. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God 
and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Just like the apostles back in chapter 5, verse 41, it says, They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. If you were arrested because you had a Christian testimony, would you be thankful for it? Would you complain about it? Would you say, woe is me, and they're picking on me, and call the ACLU and demand your rights and so forth? Or would you say, God, thank you that you've allowed me to share in some part of Christ's suffering and identify with that. Christ said, these things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. Paul taught giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians 5, 20. Giving thanks always for all things. Not just thank God for the good things. Not just thank God for pleasant things that everybody enjoys. But can you thank God when hardships come? Can you thank God when challenges and difficulties come? When it's a, whether it's a financial problem, whether it's some medical, physical health problem, can you thank God for it? Can you thank God for untimely deaths of loved ones? You're supposed to. Now how can I do that? Why can I? How, how in the world can I do something like that? Why would God ask me to do something like that? Because you have to be completely dependent upon the kindness and the mercy and the grace and the compassion of God to get you through. As a believer in Jesus Christ, that should be an easy thing for you. But sometimes we don't let it be that easy. We, we make it difficult on ourselves. Sometimes we're our own worst enemy when it comes to living for God and thanking him for the challenges and the things he sends in life. By this attitude, Stephen not only suffered voluntarily, but he suffered victoriously for Jesus Christ. How many Christians today want to quit and to give up? rather than take whatever life sends them and trust Jesus Christ all the way to the end of their life. You know, we all want God. You know, now, let's not discount the fact that Jesus was standing when he saw Stephen standing up for his faith. I'm not going to say that that was not a part of it. And that's been a great inspiration for some good sermons over the generations. But we want God to notice what we do. We want God's approval of what we do. I think every Christian should want God to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We want God's uh, acceptance and his approval of what we have to give to him, what we have to do for his sake and to offer for his gospel. But so many Christians want to just throw in the towel and quit. They stop reading their Bible. They stop praying. They stop going to church to be with other Christians. They stop taking interest in spiritual matters. They become like just so many other People in the world where the only things important to them are television and you know something on the radio or you name it things that are just so temporary because they think God treated them poorly they think God was unfair to them I tell you what that's a Christian who's never been reading their Bible they've never thought listen and I was I was telling um, I think sister Terry this morning no matter how bad my problem may be, there's always somebody whose problem is worse. In seven, over seven billion people in this world, there's always somebody else whose problems are worse than yours. Thank God for the problems you don't have. And even on that basis, just say, thank you, God, for the problem I have because it's not as bad as that person over there. I don't know how they're getting through it, but God, I'm trusting you to get me through my problem. 
I don't want to simply finish one day. I want to finish well. Not only is a good, a faithful servant, but also a, a faithful soldier, a good soldier for Jesus Christ. And so should you want to. This was the spirit of Stephen, to serve, to speak, and to suffer because God chose him to do so. The Apostle Paul said, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. When you enter into the body of Jesus Christ as a Christian by faith, you become a new believer in Jesus Christ. Whether you know it or not, whether you realize it or not, you are enlisted in the spiritual service, military service of Jesus Christ. You take whatever gifts and talents you have and you apply those things to his honor, to bring some honor to Jesus Christ. And um, God, God drafts you into his army or his Marine Corps. Sorry, there's some Marines here. I don't want to. I don't want to offend any uh, any of the jarheads that are here today. And he recruits you into his service. But what if he recruits you to suffer? He said um, about the Apostle Paul, um, I'm going to show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And uh, he certainly did. Beaten, scourged, shipwrecked, thrown in prison multiple times. But if God chooses you to suffer, then so be it. 